This episode is sponsored in part by PTZ Optics. Why need a cameraman when you can just do it yourself? Visit ptzoptics.com for more information. Hey guys, welcome to another edition of Broadcast Now, the show that talks about everything that has to do with live video, broadcasting, streaming, cameras, microphones, you name it, we talk about it here on Broadcast Now. Joining me as always, we've got Mr. Marty McFadden from podjam.tv. Welcome. Hello, sir. How are you? I am doing well. It's uh, it's great to be here on this Thursday evening, as always, and uh, it's great it to see you there. Is. Still waiting for you to start changing your setup here. We're still. You know what? I've been absolutely working my buttocks off, so it's just I haven't even had time to even check it out. Luckily, I, I'm I'm lucky. I have a light back there to give it a little separation. <laughs> So, I mean, this is about bare bones as it gets, you know, but I want, you know, I'm, I have big plans okay. it's all up here. All right. So, all right. We'll, we'll hold you to happens. it. And yeah, from, his, you will. from the Palacio Studios, 13 feet above seawall, <laughs> we've got Mr. Greg. You know Perry. it, Stephen. Thank you, brother. We are towering high, 13 feet above the, the uh, I messed up South now. Mercer Street. <laughs> you, you, you threw me off. I'm broadcasting <laughs> live on broadcast now. Towering 13 feet above South Mercer Street from the 16125. I do want to say, though, when I grow up, I want to be like Marty McPadden. And secondly, <laughs> secondly, that's not a light behind you for depth perception. That is a halo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, that's, if, uh, if that's what you want to call it, I'll go with that. That's a halo. <laughs> Oh, my God. We got a good crew in here tonight, Steve, and I already see Alfred Berger jumping on over on uh, YouTube. Haps is loading up. We're already having people trolling. Lindsey Badger's in the house. Brad, the B-Rad, and the chat is getting going really good. Michael Murray. Uh, Luke Mc... Luke Mac... Bonjour from the Great White North. So those are a couple of ones I was looking at, Stephen. Awesome. Be awesome, man. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, if you guys are over on any of these social platforms, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, uh, Facebook, just know that we can pull your comments in. We haven't gotten that far yet with HAPS, but hopefully down the road that they'll bake, bake that in and we can get that pulled in through vMix uh, social. That would be awesome. But, guys, I want to start off before we get into the camera stuff. There's some big news that happened this week in the broadcast world, and it wouldn't be a broadcasting show unless we discuss that. And the folks over at NewTek slash NDI released and announced NDI version 5. Well, you might, have mentioned, you might have known from last time we mentioned about NDI being a powerful tool to use in broadcasting. What does this mean? Well, it now allows seamless integration with Adobe Creative Cloud as well as Final Cut Pro. If you guys are into the production suites that are for pros, this is something that's huge. Also, NDI Bridge. What does that mean? That means you can now securely share NDI network sources anywhere in the world, not just on your local network, using a single network port. So, in essence, Marty... Myself and Greg, we're all using switchers. We're all using things like that. We can share our sources with each other in our own production software and hardware and be able to bring those in in our independent respective switchers. So that's huge. Um, the NDI HX camera app turns any iOS and Android mobile device into an IP-ready live video source. Um, it's easier everywhere to get this going with RUDP. It transfers, makes WAN and Wi-Fi connections more resilient with less configuration required. NDI Remote is another option in, in the NDI 5, which shares live video and audio using Internet-connected NDI-enabled devices just using an, a URL. And the last bit of information from that is... ARM support and what that means for what, Marty? Android devices, Raspberry Pis, all that good stuff. And, and also, Matt, if you're an Apple guy like me, Mac, uh, especially the M1 processor, which is ARM-based. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I remember, Stephen, you remember this. I remember when NDI first launched. Uh, how many years ago now? Like five or six years? It has to be that that long ago. Um, and that was just the beginning. And we were, and there were a lot of doubters. We were, oh, IP, like you don't need SDI, yep. you don't need cable. But I'll tell you, now that's in this fifth uh, iteration, 
and we were talking off camera and for folks that are getting into production for the first time, my recommendation would be if you're going to learn anything from the ground up, especially if you're just getting into it, or if you've been in for a while, learn networking, learn computer networking about your routers, about bandwidth, all that stuff, um, IP addresses, that type of stuff, because uh, NDI is based on that, and learn um, cloud-based production. It kind of is related, but NDI keeps getting better and better. Like you mentioned, Stephen, I think one of the big um, features from this new iteration is being able to grab sources remotely anywhere on the internet uh, that, that are made available to you. Before it was just on your local network, now it's anywhere, uh, which is fantastic. So if we're doing show, like we all have setups, if we're doing shows, I can imagine at some future point during our show, we can start sharing um, sources, all kinds of interesting things. So, you know, and also just the setup of using NDI. Think of the cabling, Stephen, in your studio, you had to do all kinds of SDI cabling. Now it's all over the network and anything that's on your network becomes a source. So it's just, it's just fantastic. I mean, just the compression, the quality's gotten better. And, well, and, um, and Greg, you were talking before about, you know, when doing remote production, you know, when I was having some issues with the TriCaster, you were like, hey, I could produce it here. Now you could do that essentially because I could send you all of my camera feeds, anything from this studio that's working, and you could remotely produce it there. Correct. What, what I like about it is, is, is it's exactly what Marty said. And if you actually go to New Tech's site um, and you um, read what they have to say, they say basically this NDF5 allows you to um, connect any camera, any source, anywhere in the world. So basically what has happened with this new release, it, is, it has revolutionized um, the NDI platform. In fact, let me just give you a personal testimony. Um, what was it, Stephen? A couple of weeks ago, you made the suggestion for me on my own programs to add a second streaming computer. And, yes. I, you know, I, I added a second streaming computer, went through the entire process of setting up, resetting up the studio with capture cards and all this stuff, connecting it, battled with it for hours and Stephen and I are talking and I said, Stephen, the capture cards, I, this is, this is a nightmare. And Stephen goes, you know what? You're going to do NDI. And it was probably three or four hours. I was routing cables, setting up, um, capture cards, uh, finding the sources, et cetera, et cetera. And this is no joke. Once <laughs> I had a switch in my studio, had everything connected on the switch. It was literally five minutes and I was up running seamlessly, audio, video, everything. So in my studio now, I'm 95% NDI and I'm not going back. I love it. It just, it just adds to it. And Joe Zahedis in the chat room, he was asking earlier, he says, what? So audio and video, real time, back and forth. That's what they're saying. And if so, this is going to kill SRT. I know this is something that, and when I say that, let me just say it like this. I'm saying that loosely because the NDI is going to be a lot easier to use. You're not going to be playing network administrator like you have to do with SRT. But I do feel like you won't need SRT anymore with this protocol. So rumor is by the end of the month, according to NDI.TV, this will be available for us to download I'm hoping I can get my hands on it a little early to play with it um, and give you guys some feedback on it. But, hey, it, it's moving in the right direction, you know, and it kind of takes us into what we're going to talk about today in the camera realm uh, because there's so many great options out there. And we, we've gotten a lot of feedback the, the last show with the tips. They're like, hey, tell me, tell me what camera I should buy. And I think we want to go through some practicalities with that to help you find the camera you need and brad's giving me a lot of grief in there he's like you need to get yourself a big boy mic uh but brad there's a reason i'm not using my big boy mic as you put it i have to be mobile today in the studio and have to take you on a little journey to where my cameras are at so uh that's that's kind of why that's there but he, he you know there's always one you guys notice that there's always one in the that's, chat room that's why they, that's why they call him b-rad so. <laughs> 
So uh, what I'm going to do now is what well, I'm going to cut over to the camera that we have here uh, to kind of to kind of get into this and demonstrate, so not really demonstrate, but kind of show you. Um, and the guys will, will help commentate as we go. So most people, when they get into live streaming, they get one of these. And it doesn't have to be the PTZ Optics brand. It just happens to be the only webcam that I own except for the integrated ones. Um, they'll look for these, what, $99, $100. This is how they get rolling with it. Um, they're fully adjustable. That you can. They have a little clip here that you can hook on your monitor or it has a hot shoe mount or I'm sorry, a quarter 20 that you can hook on a tripod and, and a, you know, set it up how you're, to your liking. And then it has a lens cover on this particular model. Not all of them have that. Uh, the, the downside to this, without it putting an extension cable, guys, is this four-foot USB cable, meaning you can't really get a huge, huge shot, even, even though you do get a wide-angle lens with it. Um, it's not really rated for, you know, high video production where you're trying to get distance on it. But I think everybody here on the panel has has started with at least one of these or something similar, right? Yeah, I have a Logitech um, 920 HD sitting by my left hand. Um, that's what I started with. Let me actually, let me give you this one, Stephen, and boom. This is what I started with right here was my... Um, I gave you side cam, didn't I? Yeah. Um, this Logitech, same kind of setup. Everything's gold in it. And I'm going to be honest with you. If I had to go with a webcam, I really got some pretty good images out of this. You can buy these still uh, about 79 bucks. It's, um, it does pretty good with light. It's wide angle. Um, I never really had any issues with USB failure on it. So overall, honestly, this was a great camera to start with. And this is where, as you said, most people start their journey. So, of course, I kept I kept it and it's in the shelf. And, you know, maybe I just throw this in here as a little tip of the week. Never get rid of your cameras. <laughs> and let me tell you why you never get rid of your cameras. And that is because you never know when you're going to need it or be. You never know when you'll have the opportunity to help somebody out who also is getting into some type of broadcasting or streaming or they're recording videos, maybe for their school, organization, church, job, whatever. And is, there's really not a better feeling in life than being able to help somebody out and give them something. So even tonight, I'll throw another big shout out to Stephen Haywood, because once all this cranked up last year, um, you know, it, <laughs> He just became the man for me that helped equip all this studio. And it all started from little cameras, and it has just grown. So keep everything and always be ready to give something away. Now, the next next set of cameras that I've got set up here, um, I'm a big uh, fan of, like, the GoPro-style cameras here. Now, not every one of these is a GoPro, but they are GoPro clones. I think, I think this one is the actual GoPro, yeah. I I'm not sure if you have enough of those cameras. Yeah, though. well, you know what? I use these <laughs> on the boat a lot, and I use these in a tree stand, but I also use them in a car if I'm shooting video. Um, you know, when I was doing my my uh, videos for getting games on the Saturday, I would set them up in the car, record them at different angles. Uh, but, they, but they're very versatile. But a lot of guys, believe it or not, they'll use them with a capture card. So... A lot of these have a micro HDMI or they have a micro USB, and I know it's going to be hard for you guys to see it, but there's ports on them, that you can buy a cable on Amazon and convert that to HDMI and run it to a capture card. Now, a lot of these generic ones, it's going to be hit or miss, but I know with the GoPros, uh, you do have that ability, but also the apps. A lot of guys, including myself, were capturing them on iOS devices using NDI, bringing that into the production uh, within the studio just as like a bird eye studio shot. And these aren't, these aren't cheap by any means. They're like three, $400 depending on, you know, what you're getting with them. But that's something that, you know, I found as, as a good point of view or, or like studio shot. The other one, I use these a lot for hunting, but I also use them for, again, point of view or some of you guys that do modding, whether it's computer modding, arcade modding, or, you know, just building it's a great option. You, you know, you can put it on the you put it on your head, and you can get the over the shoulder look. And it's a one button start. 
It's got a micro SD card inside here, as well as a rechargeable battery. This streams to an application, so you can actually see what the camera is seeing. And this is a great little device. It's got a great picture. It, it does uh, 1080p, does 4K. Um, it's a great way for you to get some video from a different perspective as opposed to, uh, you know, just standing there with a camcorder in, in, in your hand. Um, and I think, uh, Greg, are you pulling up something? Is that what you were? Or Marty, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, no, I, I, but I can't comment on. Uh, yes. It's funny. I, I kidded you with having all those cameras. How many <laughs> do you have there? But there's a reason for it, and kind of tagging on what Greg was saying about never throwing away your cameras, each camera type, including the webcam, it has a specialized purpose yes. and, and, and as a use case. And talking about those, those GoPros, it's like we started with the webcam, relatively inexpensive. You can get a pretty decent image out of it. You know, again, has its limitations, but it's particularly useful on a computer in a very, uh, um, clo you know, very tight environment. You plug it in, you're ready to go. It's great for starting out. Those GoPro style cameras, like Steven was mentioning, they're particular, and you notice the waterproof housing, that's the advantage. Now you're stepping up to a, a different league here. So these are more real type of cameras with larger sensors. They're specialized still. They tend to have wider angle views. Uh, they're particularly good outdoors, like with those all weather cases, you can put them on a boat. You can, like Steve and I know use them in hunting situations where mm -hmm. we're getting um, uh, outdoor footage. Uh, also, they're used in, in cinema um, where you're getting shots where you can't get with a, with a full size camera. You might attach them to the outside of a car or, or to getting different angles. And they're, and they're relatively inexpensive. They have really good image quality and they fit in very tight spaces. Um, so they're really good for that. Uh, and they're also all weather, uh, and you can put a bunch of them out there. So they're particularly good for that. So it's kind of a step up, uh, again, we'll get into other cameras, but, but again, when we're going through these cameras, think about use cases. And also it's many people that are into video and production, you'll have, uh, you know, a number of cameras and like Steven does number of cameras, number of camera types and they're all for different situations. So those are particularly good for the situations that, that Stephen mentioned for sure. Absolutely. Greg, did you have something I wanted to check with you before I went on to the next set no, of cameras? Oh, well, you saw, Stephen, you're seeing all the behind the scenes. So actually I jumped out and I was, <laughs> you know, when you're doing a live program and you start thinking about cameras and then you sit there <laughs> and un, un, start rolling out 7,942 cameras, um, <laughs> It, it makes me start thinking, okay, I'm feeling very, uh, I, I don't have 7,942 ca uh, cameras, nor do I have an angelic glow like Marty. And I go, <laughs> so what do I have? And I was actually trying to find my drone because I was going to show that you can have cameras anywhere. <laughs> and I started thinking about my drone now, how it may be possible to connect that through, uh, it, NDI may be in the future. I was going to say, hey, let's do, let's just expand the uh, boundaries here as to what's possible. And I left the studio for a second to go grab it. And I think my son is out flying it or something. It's not <laughs> where it's supposed to be. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm back now and ready to go. But cameras are limitless. And I know we're going to get into to more now. So I have some more thoughts on something. And we'll show you in just a minute. So back at you. Yeah. So the, like, like Greg said, my drone is down on the bottom here. I can't get it out right now, but I, I agree. The drones are, are huge. Um, I guess the next step up, I would say, if you were going to go, uh, because most TV shows that you're watching, the reality shows, they're using those GoPros in the, in, in the shotgun seat. They're using them. Uh, in the in the vehicles, a lot of guys are using it on selfie sticks. The next step up is a consumer grade camcorder. Now, this is one of the last uh, DV cameras, and I'm going to open this if I can um, without the battery. So, a DV style camera has the HDV tape, if you will. They're real small tapes. Uh, nobody used them for that, but they were. These cameras were great. These were, uh, and you can go on eBay right now. The H, the Vixia HV40 can, Canon cameras. I love Canon for, for camcorders. You're going to notice that. Now, I do want to stress, just because I love Canon, that doesn't mean you have to go out and buy a Canon. I just personally like Canon cameras. 
Uh, I'm not getting paid to say that. It's just, you know, it's my preference. Panasonic makes great cameras. Sony makes great cameras. But this was a sub at the time when it was new, a sub five six $600 camcorder. That is still a lot of money. But the image quality on this 1080, uh, 720, and it was one of the cheaper cameras that did HDMI. So HDMI out of the back, but it also did something that a lot of our computer folks, and maybe people watching this for the first time, had no idea about, and it's called FireWire. Apple made this <laughs> protocol back in the day, and this was something that a lot of us streamers used in the beginning uh, was FireWire and being able to connect multiple cameras without capture cards, which we will get to in a little while. And I apologize for the shaking of the camera. I think my kids are running around upstairs. Uh, but you have, you know, the, the pullout just like you do on a, a camcorder from today, and we'll, we'll get to those. But also you have DSLRs, okay? And these SLRs are what a lot of cinematology is using today. Uh, but I would suggest whether you go Nikon or Canon, you get one with a flip-out screen because you, when you're shooting video, you need to be able to see it, whether you're on camera or you're off camera, um, you know, whether you want to do just photography or photography and video, the downside to one of these, and I know Marty, you're a photographer as well. Mm -hmm. The downside to these, you can only record at a half an hour a shot unless you're spending a lot of money on a DSLR. I mean, I'm talking thousands of dollars. This one here was $600 out the door because I didn't need something that was outrageously expensive to do a little video, a little bit of pictures, um, but you can't, use it as a webcam for more than, I think, I want to say it's 27 minutes or it shuts down or even recording, and that's to protect the servos in them. Um, but this also can hook up via HDMI uh, on the side with a micro or mini HDMI. And we're going to get into some of these cables here in a little bit. But uh, this would be my next setup if I was going to uh, say what the next step was. Yeah, the thing the thing about DSLRs, uh, and you raise a very good point, especially the older ones. They had they were primarily designed for still photography, and the video uh, component came along after that. So the sensors would heat up, and that's why you were mentioning you can only run them for twenty minutes or so. They have a time limit. It's really a heat issue. Uh, but some of these DSLRs, especially the mirrorless cameras. The newer ones, I think, are much better in that arena. In fact, some of them don't have any kind of issue at all. So check on that. The other thing with DSLRs is they're more complex. They do give you the that's that's the downside. So you do have to there is a learning curve to using these cameras. But the upside is, you know, the the interchangeable lenses is a, is a big issue, a big big upside. Uh, it enables you to get uh, a nice depth of field effect. So you've seen streamers or you've seen video people. That's why video people use these, where they can control the depth of field. So you've seen shots probably where the subject may be in focus and the background is blurred. That's called like a bokeh effect. But that's very pleasing because you it, it puts the attention on the subject and it gives you a lot of dimension in your shot. But again, it's it has to do with the lens focal length, the aperture. It gets into kind of complex things in a photography related uh, sense. So if you're willing to kind of dig in and learn about it, you can get some really professional results. Uh, and again, I think all these cameras and all these things that we're talking about here, there are learning curves, there are the more work you want to put into it, the more you want to learn about it, the better results you're going to be. It's not necessarily about money. Although as you go up the equipment ladder and get better and better equipment, it's capable obviously of more things, more, more quality. But I want to emphasize even with a webcam, the more you learn how to actually frame, light a scene, the more you're going to be able to get out of each stage, each type of camera, and the better results you're going to get. I give a big here here on that, Marty. Here, here's the deal. So tonight we're talking about cameras, and you know, Stephen, Marty, myself, we're already planning shows weeks and weeks in advance. We talk about different topics we're going to be dealing with, but. For me, you know, I, I actually was over Steven's studio not too long ago. He showed me that camera and I held it. So you have to start thinking about application. You have to start thinking about budget. You have to start thinking about, as Marty was saying, where do you want to invest your time? I appreciated what Marty said at the end there. You can take a C920 HD and you actually can get a phenomenal image out of it. Um, you, you're dealing with lighting. You're dealing with 
framing, all the things, and I'm not going to repeat what Marty said, but those are things that you can get beautiful quality out of. And of course, you'll never get the depth of field. You, you may not have, you know, pan tilt zoom control, but where do you want to put your dollars? But because we're not only talking about high end streaming here, you know, I, I see it in the stream from Rainwater Games, 7,942 cameras are needed to find my good side. Um, you know, we all do not have 7,942 cameras. So where are we going to put our resources? Where are we going to put our time management? And where are we going to spend our, you know, ultimately our energy to prepare ourselves to give the best product that we are, whether, whether you're doing a gaming show, news show, or, or this is your work or this is your hobby. So it's not only a time issue, it's a financial issue. And where can you find the best melting pot of both? to give you um, the best quality for your cameras. And, and like I was sharing with you guys earlier, you know, Steven was talking about that uh, Vixia HV40. So I'm just gonna show you, when Steven was setting me up, he says, listen, I want you to take this camera right here. And this is the Vixia HD40 and was using it at the beginning for the exact applications he was talking about. It worked fantastic. Another option, Steven, I know you're probably going there, but it's in the same family. This is um for like a b-roll or just some type of you know this is not the greatest camera in the world but you're it's sdi you run it through a capture card but what it's doing is it's just giving you other options and i know we're getting ready to get into cell phones and i just want to say one last thing about the d well the the uh, dslr and that is that is this um for me i like maybe a camera that's multi-purpose. So if you put all that money into a DSLR, you know, <clears throat> that's quite a bit of budget there. And I know Marty's going to be talking about this in a moment when we get to mobile phones. But even when I was holding Steven's DSLR, and I know we deal with tripods, you know, we're going to put it on a tripod. Here's a great tripod. But if you're trying to do something remote and you're having to deal with image stabilization and weight of the camera that you're holding, um, for me, those DSLRs can be a little little challenging. So that's just a little bit of my two cents uh, thrown in there, Stephen. No, ab absolutely. I'm glad you I'm glad you threw that in there because what what I'm going to get to through all this is is to show you what I believe would be the best choice for you uh, overall through all these cameras. And I'm fortunate enough I have these cameras. I, I don't throw anything away. Ask my wife. Uh, because for that very thing, like Greg said, if somebody's starting out and I can help them out, I, I want to help them out. I'll get more out of that than than trying to you know find a buyer for it. But as Greg said, these are great. Uh, this is an EPTZ camera. You know, just a little disclaimer: I do work for the company that makes these cameras. But uh, like he was saying, you know, you can connect this up for SDI. This isn't for everybody. But these cameras I wanted to bring in because if you notice, it has a, a bunch of letters right under here. It says NDI HX. We talked about NDI 5 being out and, and these cameras being connected via NDI. This is the type of shot that I use that type of camera for. That camera is essentially right above me. I'm just going to bring this in the frame. This is shooting down right on this. That's the only thing I use that camera for is to give you guys that bird's eye perspective. That's the only thing that I, I use this for. And this camera here, I use it on a slider. Those of you familiar with a video slider or photography slider, you stick it on there and it just slowly moves just to give, um, as I call it, a dump camera, a way that I can have a different image or a different video that I could cut to if I'm setting up other shots with, say, these. For live streaming, I, you know, I, you guys know I'm using these cameras, these pan tilt zoom cameras. They move around based on the software. They can go up and down. These also have connections, but you know we're going to get into these. These are the H. These are the NDI capable, but you can do uh, you can do. They have USB for firmware, but they've got uh, power switch here, RS two thirty two. That's another way that you can. It's an older way to control and connect, but it's got the SDI here, and it's got HDMI and Ethernet. Right now, on my mobile rig, I only use Ethernet right here. I'm powering it for NDI. And control everything it makes it so much easier. I don't have to use SDI, and for that, it's 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 huge because I'm able to do so many things with it. Now, the last camera I have besides 
as as Greg alluded to earlier, the cell phone is this camera. This is the Canon XA40. It's a 4K camera. This, if I had to choose one camera that I could do everything with. Now, this is a $1,500 camera. It's a lot cheaper than a PTZ Optics camera that all it does is stream. You're not going to record to it. You're not going to do anything. These are, you know, two grand, $2,200. This is the camera, or a camera like this is what I would recommend for folks that want a multi-purpose camera that don't have a lot of money, but they're they're willing to sink some money into it to have long long recordings, 4K, have the ability to do professional audio where you have the XLR inputs, or as you can see, I'm using a Rode shotgun mic. I'm going to put it out there so you guys can see. Um, I have that connected via eighth inch right here on the side. This also does HDMI. I think the XA45 does SDI. It's got the hood here for the, the light where you flip this up for your... Um, for your lens, it's got the pop-out window that completely rotates around. This, I think, next to, coupled with your cell phone for B-roll or even, you know, for, for regular shots, I think this would be your go-to camera, a camera like this, whether it's Panasonic, whether it's, you know, uh, Canon. In my opinion, this is, this, is what I would, this is what I would go with, something like this that you could use it for streaming, you could use it for YouTube videos, you could use it for real tight close-ups. Guys, you could use it for even having that bokeh background effect if you were going to do, you know, blurring things, you know, outside. I know, Marty, you use, a, what, a Sony uh, for your... Yeah, yeah, I have a couple Sonys. I have the I have the PTZ optics camera as well. I have another camera, uh, a PTZ camera as well. Uh, the thing with that um, camcorder uh, is versatility, like you just mentioned. It's not going to, like, the di again, it's all about choices, mm -hmm. compromise, and priority. I, mean, I saw in the HAPS chat, you know, budget, that's, a, that's another ingredient. But think of it this way. Along with your budget, it's what is your priority in your use case. That's right. You know, you're going to, and it's also what compromises you're going to make. Because with tech, any kind of technology, there's no perfect all do it all one thing. You're gonna have to make so the DSLR is great for cinematic shots. It's very it's complex with the lenses and all that stuff, but it's got a lot of control. But it takes it has a learning curve. The camera that Stephen just showed the the can the 4K Canon is a great all around. Well, in the business you call it ENG electronic news gathering, a kind of an old term, but it's an all around great camera. For anything, including and the and what makes that professional, in my opinion, not only the 4K but the audio on that, where you have the XLR inputs and XLR is just a professional way to get audio into something. It uses balanced audio connections versus unbalanced. So, like an unbalanced connection would be just a, a normal like uh, a headphone jack, and there's no ground the, the grounding there. Is, it's 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 you tend to get a little hum with the XLR, and you'll see this in professional studios. It's three three conductor, and so it's grounded. You don't get hum, but it's a professional way to get audio around. And use XLR cables, but that's a huge advantage, you know. And that handle comes off, so you're able to get. I think it's two channels, and you're able to rec um, record two separate channels. Yep. So you can do interviews. You can, especially in post production, is great. But it gives you versatility as far as use case goes. So not only the audio, but then you have the video, you have the zoom lens in there. So you don't have to fool around with lenses. If you're using the right settings, if you're using lens more open as far as the aperture goes and maybe zoomed in a little bit where you have the camera away and maybe use a, a longer focal length, you can get that kind of like that, that blurred effect. So there's all kinds of ways you can do it. But yeah, I mean, that would be how I would summarize that camera, Stephen, is, is professional versatility as far as video goes, it yep. gives you a nice solid picture uh, and does a lot of different things that, all in one package. After Greg gives this comment, I, I, I want to go into the next part of that where we explain what's the differences between the professional camera. Why would I want to spend that kind of money? What are the features that I'm getting and why? And we could even show you, you know, some of the connections and, and what they are, what they mean. But go ahead, Greg. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe let's say it this way. 
you're either in the cameras or you're not. And uh, Stephen, you were sitting there talking about um, Firewire. Let, let me let me drop this one on you, boys. I, I was doing video production, and listen, I'm no Marty McPadden, but I was just a hobbyist, and then all this streaming stuff just unfolded on me. But I, I always used to make videos because I traveled the world um, as a missionary. I was I work in about 38 nations. I speak Russian fluently. So I, I've spent lots of time in multiple countries and um, I would do lots of travel videos. And if I had known then what I know now, I would have the number one travel YouTube in the history of the planet. Um, I, I should have started one from day one, but I didn't. But I would make compilation videos. And that's back in the day of your VHS C. And then you went to the big time mini DV. Um, and then, Stephen, you know, if you, you're showing your cameras, l let me show you something. Uh oh, he's gonna bring awesome out a high eight, I think. <laughs> oh boy. He's... Nope. Oh, it's a Canon. I love that. Oh, Canon XLS one. Okay. And this is what I was using. But here's the problem. It weighs nine million pounds. Yes. And um I had two of those in the... my studio. Okay, so you know you were firewire four hundred, then you were <laughs> firewire. Oh, and then we went big time because we were firewire eight hundred. And it's like, yep. okay, I'm, I'm a laser now. Um, so <laughs> you're either in the cameras or you're not. But with that said, you, you have to have some understanding and some growth. I see a question here from Rainwater Games. And it's, actually, it's a very good question. He says, sorry if you already covered this. What's the best way to get sharp close-ups for recording a board game so they can see card text details really clearly? Focusing with the webcam seems impossible on close-ups. So – very good question. Close-ups are, are always difficult to do, depending on your camera setup. Um, there are some basic things. You, you, you've got them, and I know we're going to discuss this in a moment. You make sure your, your white balance is correct. You make sure you have the proper lighting. But um, many of you may not know this, but uh, let me throw that to you right quick. You actually can run some PTZ function even through your C920 webcam um, with their Logitech capture. I've messed around with this a little bit and it works. Um, so it, it gives you an option. The other thing I know we're getting ready to talk about in just a moment is cell phones and the power that is in the, the these cameras that we're carrying around. And so uh, Rainwater, for me, maybe, if I was, because I I've watched your stream some actually, I've in, I've enjoyed it. Um, if it was me, maybe I would think more into what we began the program tonight with, and that is NDI. So instead of going out and dropping X amount of dollars on this highfalutin camera that now I, I I that's all I have, maybe I would look at making sure my studio is hardwired, everything, putting a switch in, and then maybe I would look at running NDI remote, um, which you can run NDI wirelessly remote for your iPhone. I'm not sure about Android because I only use iPhones and you can run it into your, to your, I use vMix, but Wirecast. Um, and basically you just download the NDI HX camera app. You set up the proper IP address as There's, Marty will there, be talking there, about in just a moment. There is one for Android. Yes. Okay, and away you go. And so, Rainwater, you know, you can get some pretty good macro focusing out of an iPhone. So there are options out there. Once again, I'm back to the discussion of, okay, where's your best melting point of budget that you're going to put into cameras or into production? So you find that sweet spot. But for sure, white balance and lighting is absolute key for focus, whether it's micro, macro, or macro or mucro well and i think marty and you could kind of talk with us on this next point here is connecting these 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 cameras because um you know you could go out and buy a cheap 90 dollar webcam but you don't have control over your your white balance your zoom capabilities as as rainwater's asking um, that's what you're paying for with a lot of these cameras that are more expensive, like the, the camcorder that I was showing you guys. But coming with those, it comes with a little bit of complexity. And what do I mean by that? Well, now you have to go out and buy one of these. What is it? It's a capture card. 
And this happens to be an SDI capture card. This is one that we commonly use here. It is a Magewell capture card. These run for about 300 bucks. And I know I shared with all you guys a $20 capture card that's HDMI. And it works. It's great, actually. Would I use it with a, with a camera? Absolutely not. Gameplay is one thing. Retro games is one thing because retro games are only 8 and 16-bit. You can clearly see the difference between a $300 capture card and a $20 capture card. So why is this needed? Well, if you notice on the back here, there's an SDI port or BNC port. You need to get yourself some BNC cable, like so. Turn halfway, turn it on, it locks in, and then you connect the other end to your capture, uh, your capture card, and then you plug it into your computer via USB. Why SDI over HDMI? SDI, you can run about 600 meters before you start seeing some degradation in quality. Uh, with HDMI, I don't recommend more than 15 to 25 feet, depending on the cable. That's just my personal preference. That's not written in stone anywhere. That's just my personal preference. I start seeing macro blocking after that. Everybody knows what the HDMI cables look like. Uh, and the reason I'm showing that is because they also make, if you go with the Canon, they also make these mini HDMI to HDMI. And it's very important to understand when you start getting into these things, you have to purchase a capture card or maybe you need to convert it. You need to run a long length. They sell these converters. Some you can get for 20, 25 bucks. They're cheap. These I've had for almost 10 years and they work great from Aja. Um, SDI in to, uh, actually this one is, yeah, this one's SDI in. So I could take the SDI from this instead of going to the capture card. So we could essentially do this. Let me get that out of the way. We could go into here. And then what this is going to do is it's going to convert it to HDMI. So then I could plug in an HDMI cable on the other side and send that signal into an HDMI capture card. But now you're talking, depending on how long a cable you need, you know, 50 to 100 bucks for a cable. That's a couple hundred feet. $300 for a good converter, and it does power over DC into HDMI. And this is, a, this is separate from the features, Marty, that goes into these cameras to give you a better picture, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you raised some very important issues. In, in fact, like H, the difference between HDMI and SDI uh, with the, also the converters. This is not like some magical thing. Like I, I've done one of my parts of my business. I, I work on these physical events. I mean, we've been on hiatus for a while for reasons everyone knows. But when we do these events, it would involve setting up television and routing video around the around the venue and sometimes we use a little hdmi depending on if it's a short run sometimes you'd have to use sdi and then use converters and we'd bring in you know rental places and work with outside contractors to do that but these are all things you have to think about so if you're doing this on your own if you're working with hdmi understand that that's going to have a very limited cable run you know, you, they sell 100-foot HDMI cables, but they better make sure, I mean, test it. You know, SDI runs a longer way. These, the, what, what you were showing, that, you know, the AGA um, converter. Uh, there's other converters by Decimator and Blackmagic. Uh, and they're, they're not cheap, but there's a reason. It's because you have to have the right amplification. for the, It gets very technical and very complicated. But the, the bottom line is when you're dealing with all this input output IO, the most important thing you do is test and make sure it works uh, because this stuff, it's very finicky and just test it. So, you know, a, again, HDMI is shorter run, SDI is longer run. I think one of the things that we talked about earlier in the show, NDI is go, all going IP. That solves a lot of issues, you know? So like Steven, you were doing something, I think at your local high school mm -hmm. that you were relying more on, on uh, ethernet runs and, and um, uh, uh, IP uh, and also power over ethernet to run everything off of one cable. So that's kind of like you're demonstrating now, that's kind of the new thing. So the things I was just talking about with HDMI limitations, SDI, converters, all that stuff, kind of takes that out. So 
like I said at the top of the show, if I'm going to recommend to somebody getting into production, learn networking because this is where, and that's, and then cable, you're, you're sticking one cable in that camera and that's got power over that cable. So that's one cable for power and for sending video and you go through a router, it's a much simpler setup and you get just yeah, instead quality. of using all that. Right. Instead of, well, right. let me get it in frame. So you could either use one, like Marty's saying, one <clears throat> one Ethernet cable or all this and all this extra expense if you're yep. getting an NDI enabled uh, a camera. We're going to get into showing some networking stuff in the future on how to network things up and make it a little bit easier. That's a whole show. That's a whole itself. show. But before, Greg, before we get, I, I know you got a comment on that about throwing things away. I had to show this, the old iPhone. I don't throw <laughs> things away. Uh, no, which, can, is that the 4? This is a 4. I think it's a 4S four. it might be. That's a um, 4S, I think. But I, I save these for, for just that, for using a camera, because these are great for, like, over-the-shoulder cameras or, you know, pointing at that. But this is something everybody, if you're into video production and you want to get – um, even even webcams. This is called a white balancing tool. You want a camera, if you're going to buy one, that not only has auto white balance, but manual white balance, and you need one of these. Don't use a piece of paper. You can get by with a piece of paper, but this is going to give you true light refracting out of it, because if you look at it, there's textures on it. So it allows a certain amount of light through it to give you the optimal white balance. Every one of my cameras has been white balanced with this. And these are not expensive, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up here on Amazon for you. I think they're like 15 maybe 20 bucks. They are not expensive. 15 bucks. there you go. You can see I even last purchased it. This is a great tool to use no matter what kind of camera you have that has a manual white balance adjustment. This is your tip of the week right here, this manual white balancing tool now they make different size ones this happens to be one that will actually cover up a ptz optics camera and guys you can get away with using paper but honestly for the best results to get the best look with with uh white balancing you definitely want to do that because this is a camera that is white balanced incorrectly Okay, this is somebody who did not white balance their camera. That's what it looks like when they white balanced it correctly. That's the difference. We all here, we white balance our cameras. This is why our video looks the way it does. That's what you're paying for when you go with a more expensive camera, whether it's DSLR or video camera. That is important. Just in I can that remember realm. Steven when we were first setting up my studio and, and the uh, program started growing. And, and um, so a little bit of the behind the scenes here. So there's my um, PTZ 20 X right there. That's right in front of me um, with all these mom. I'm, I'm watching all these monitors when I'm doing the news programs. And then over my left shoulder, actually shooting that image is my um, Sony SRG 300 H. So, you know, I'm running a Sony and a PTZ optics. Um, and of course, they're both white balance. But I can remember when I was first doing this show, and Stephen was helping me get everything set up. And um, he's, we're, we're talking over the phone or whatever, and we're doing some test runs. And Stephen made this statement to me. He goes, "Are you not feeling well?" I said, "No, I feel great." <laughs> he goes, "Are you having liver problems, kidney problems? <laughs> no. W what's going on? Um, do you have?" Uh, why are you so jaundiced? Your everything is yellow and green. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, did you white balance your camera? <laughs> and I said, no. He goes, well, let me teach you. So here you have your learning moment. And we went through the whole process. And Stephen, just like you were saying, the difference between the auto um, white balance and then the availability to manually white balance are a huge difference sometimes. And um, so it's, it's the learning curve. It's the learning process. You know, I, I'm a Bible background guy. So it, for me, you know, it, there's a little principle in the New Testament where Paul trained Timothy. So in this industry, you're growing, you're learning. Everybody needs a mentor and a mentoree. And then once you're in that process, you find somebody to help. So whether it's about equipment 
or knowledge, um, you always want to be giving something away. And I promise you, even as Stephen said real quickly a few minutes ago, it will come back to you. And um, that's a promise. Yeah, I think I think that um, going going forward, and Marty, I'm, I'm going to let you. I want you to talk about our uh, lovely friend here because I know you shot a lot of video that you kind of caught me off guard with when you were traveling with that camera because people don't forget about this camera. This is a good camera to have uh, in your cell phone. Yeah, I have the iPhone. Tw uh, it started with the 11 uh, that I noticed a huge uh, increase in quality and especially in visual video stabilization. Before the iPhone 11, I had the 10 and, and back. I would use a, um, a gimbal that would automatically level the camera and take out the shaking and all that and stabilize the, the video. Uh, and I noticed with the 11, now even better with the 12, uh, the stabilization on this thing. You can handhold, put it on a selfie stick and, and do a pan shot and it's rock solid. And a lot of it has to do with now, it's funny because when cell phones were first getting really good with video, as, a, as, a, as an old photographer, I would be concerned about the sensor size. And if you notice, in, um, and, and Steven's putting up a gimbal, in fact, I had a similar one, not the exact same one that you put up, but similar one. That's the style where it steadies the picture. Um, I would always be concerned with sensor size. So coming from a film, I learned in film, I go way back, I'm old. And so, <laughs> so digital, uh, it's really the sensor size that matters. You know, how much light gathering, the size of the pixels, all that stuff. In a cell phone, you can see that the lenses and the sensors are tiny. So how do you get good images off of tiny sensor like that? And the pixels are, are microns across. Um, but really the secret with cell phones is the digital image processing that has come along. So a lot of the stuff that happens in an iPhone and in, in the top flight Android devices, uh, it's the digital image processing chips and what they do with the information that comes off the sensor and produce that final picture or video. And these things are, I, you know, and Stephen, you were mentioning, you know, stuff I shot on site. I mean, if you have one of these, I mean, it, it is amazing. In fact, now you have reporters and you have news gathering that are using just cell phones. You put it on a selfie stick, you, you hook in a, an external microphone, and you can get some really, really good results. I mean, these are 4K cameras. I think the latest iPhone will shoot in 4K at at least 60 frames a second. Uh, which is phenomenal. They, in fact, the newest phones shoot in ProRes. And for you video editors out there, especially Final Cut people, you know what ProRes is. Uh, it's a you know top flight codec, um, but it's it's amazing what you can get off of these. And you know, again, if you're, I mean, you've seen movies that are shot just with an iPhone, or if you're getting B-roll. I mean, and I if you go on go on YouTube search you know, iPhone 12 Pro Max and look for people doing, you know, doing sample videos. It's phenomenal. And it's getting to the point now where professionals, it's, it's really hard to tell, you know, maybe you get a Sony FS7, which is a, like a $40,000 cinema camera versus, you know, a, a thousand dollar top flight cell phone. I mean, it's, there are still some differences. I'm not saying like the and top you, cinema cameras. You have cameras, to learn how to use it too. You have to learn how you use it. There are still, but, but I mean, especially if you're doing stuff for the web and if you do the proper lighting, proper framing and all that stuff, you can get some incredible results. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just phenomenal. So don't discount that you have anybody with one of these, you already have a really great camera. In fact, Steven, you had that DSLR. I, I had, I was into Canon. I've been Nikon. I've been Canon. I had a Canon, um, really nice DSLR that I sold a number of years ago because I just don't do still photography anymore. I do a lot of video stuff and I just didn't have the use for it, but I rely on this now for a lot of shooting if I'm out and about, and it's just, I mean, you have that. So just learn how to use that camera and you get some really, really good results. Leon. Yeah. We talked about this last week and I had recently seen a guy doing a video on YouTube from, um, he's, he lives in Vietnam. And his video was such high quality, I honestly thought I was there in the video with him. And so I messaged him on YouTube and I said, hey, man, 
what camera are you using? And he messaged me back. It was the iPhone 11. So as Marty said, the iPhone 11 really is the one that makes that trip to the next level. You know, I'm still on the iPhone 7. I haven't moved to that level. And it looks like Steven's on a 4. So basically what we have are coasters. <laughs> no, um, no, no. But eventually we'll get there. Now, uh, Steven, give me one second. I want to I shoot something here or show something uh, because I saw some comments where it was saying, okay, Marty's looking a little red. Greg's looking a little orange. And, of course, I blamed it completely on Steven. Um, so it's all his fault because Marty and I are sending him absolute perfection. So <laughs> if anything is off, it's coming out of headquarters central for, there. For the record, uh, broad... I said this to him in, in uh, pre-show. I said, hey, you're looking a little dark today. <laughs> so l let me show you something here, okay? So uh, -doo -doom -doom -doom, tip of the week. <laughs> We, we, I'm back to the budget thing I'm preaching tonight. Find that happy mix. But one place that you can get something pretty decent, I, these are about 175 bucks for the pair. Let me bring uh, this camera up a little bit here. And I'm going to show you something here. Go to that. So I've got some fill lights there, okay, coming. Now, one of the things that is important in dealing with light that is coming on you, on your subject, on your gameplay, on your face, on your guests, whatever it may be, is actually the temperature of the light. So I'm going to adjust my temperature, and I'm going to do it first to show you the lights changing, and then I'm going to come back to my image and show you what it does to me. So not only do I control brightness, but I also control temperature. All right, so here's some temperature, if I can get to it. It, there we go. So watch my lights change. Yeah, it's going you see them changing the, color. More the daylight versus the white Daylight halogen. versus the dark. Now let me, yep. correct. Now let me bring it to myself here and watch me change as the same colors change. Now that's brightness. Now watch the temperature change. Oh, so you had them on the wrong temperature. Oh, that's it's cold and warm, cold and yep. warm. You got to find that Correct. balance. You've got to find that balance. So, you know, it's about 175 bucks uh, for this pair of lights. They're controlled by a remote control. Uh, they're made by Dasney. I, I have nothing to do with that company, but they've been excellent. Um, I can, of course, control the lighting wrong, the brightness wrong, the temperature wrong. Um, but eventually, Stephen will help me figure it all out. <laughs> yeah, blame me. <laughs> <laughs> but no he, he's absolutely right so you know temperature can play a role even if you have the white balance right so i think and we'll get into this lighting is a whole different show but whole just to, show. just to put a cap on that though if you're using mixed bulbs in your room like i don't turn on my regular room lights and mix them with the studio lights you're gonna have a bad effect you don't want to do that all your lights if you're using ones, if you're using like Greg has, the temperature controlled with the numbers on the back, your other lights should also have those numbers because you want to dial them all in to the exact same temperature slash brightness. But again, that's a, that's a whole different show that we can get into. And, you know, when, when we talk about the phones, they also have control for your iris, you know, all things like that. The main thing that I see going wrong with folks using cameras is not understanding how they work, not understanding the shutter speed, not understanding the white balance in there, how they can better their picture just by playing with some of those settings. And how do you get those settings? You got to buy a better camera. I hate to say that I keep harping on buying a better camera. A lot of these cameras for the last 15 years I've done this. So I've had these cameras that I purchased, those little point and shoots that I showed earlier, those GoPros or, or even like this, the Tacticam, you can't do that with that. You get the picture, it is what it is, but they're meant for just shooting B-roll or shooting, uh, you know, out in a, in a, a location like a boat. I'm not going to take my $2,000 camera and throw it on a boat. I'm just not going to do it. So, or I think, Marty, you made mention uh, getting a shot as, as you're getting the tires rolling away from a car, you know, uh, that people are using cinema. Those are things that you're going to use specific cameras for, just like an artist uses different pencils to draw different things. You're using cameras. Leon over on LinkedIn said, great information. Nick Thomas says, always, and then he laughed at Greg's comment about it was all my fault. 
because everybody blames me all the time. I, so. I, I know we're up against time. Can I give one app recommendation uh, on the iPhone? Um, if you're looking out on the iPhone camera, it, it's very capable, but it's set up to be simple. So you can change some settings, but it's it's the way that Apple designs it. It designed for people that want simplicity and don't want to have to fiddle around too much. You can change the focal length. But if you really want to dig into the settings, there are several apps out there that allow you to go in and change aperture, change shutter speed, uh, all kinds of different settings. The the app that I use for that is called Filmic Pro. I think it's just a, it's a, a few dollars on the App Store. Uh, it is a paid app, but it's certainly, if you want to dig into all the settings, uh, it's certainly worth it. It does stuff with, with audio as well. It records, it re you can record in different formats. They're a Filmic Pro. It's an excellent professional app. Um, and again, it's not very expensive. They keep updating it. They, the developers are really good about that. Uh, they also, with the newer um, iPhones that have a front-facing camera and rear-facing camera and also the different lenses, the, the latest version of Filmic Pro is also capable of accessing each camera separately. So, for example, I know one of the settings where you can, I think it's Filmic Pro, there might be another app out there where you can actually do a split screen and film yourself with the front-facing camera and maybe do an interview with someone using the rear-facing camera. Things like that that aren't built into the Apple um, system uh, that allow you to access all these different, all these different features and really dig into the settings. So it's an excellent app. I use it all the time. Filmic Pro, if you really want to dig into it and uh, and get really in the nitty gritty. I can attest, I use it too. Yep. And uh, Rainwater says it's fourteen ninety nine on the Android Play Store. That's because Google has to make their money some somehow because many people don't use Android. Sorry. I'm just, I'm, it was a joke. I'm just kidding. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if maybe they're doing a deal with iOS. I saw it was seven ninety nine. On iOS, um, let's see. What is Android? <laughs> I uh, believe I'm, it or not, I'm... I hate to say this, but I own it for both Android because I tried using Android. I own it for both Android and iOS. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, it's already been purchased. So I can't app. even tell you what yeah. it, it, it's, it's great. I'm not. I'm not anti-Android. I got lots of friends that have them, but but the bottom line is, in, in what we're talking about, it's just my opinion. Um, whether it be dealing with the camera system that are in the new iPhones, but equally important is the software experience that's available, whether it's in editing, camera activity, or post-production, all from your iPhone and just blow people away. It, you just can't touch Apple in that world. <laughs> Joe, it's not possible. Joe's the height as he cracks me up because it's better on Android. <laughs> 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 listen, we're not hating. No, listen, I have I have some no. Android tablets that I also use for cameras as Marty. That's why I own that. So use what you have and do the best that you can with what you have. But Absolutely. I I hope this kind of today's show, I hope this kind of enlightened you on how you should proceed in buying a streaming camera or a camera that you want to have multi-purpose with it. That's why I recommended that Canon or your phone is a great way to do it as long as you're using the right tools. A gimbal is a must if you're going to use your phone. You need to get a gimbal or something that you can stand it on like we discussed last week. The main thing is buy some of these cameras. Even like I buy the cheap generic GoPros because if they fall overboard on the boat, they still give me the quality. I'm not going to be heartbroken that a $50 camera as opposed to a $400 GoPro just went into the lake. It's not going to bother me any. Um, well, let me ask you this question. See, this may be really help because what you're saying there. So if you were starting a stream today, okay, and you were going to purchase your first camera and you needed it to have multiple purposes and you wanted to start a stream, what camera would you start with, Stephen? I would go on eBay and I would look for a, a Canon camcorder that has multiple multiple purposes that would fall into the range of four hundred to six hundred dollars because I don't think you're going to find something that you can zoom in, and as Rainwater was talking about, wanting to zoom in on tight things. An iPhone is as great a video as it shoots, unless you're going to stream from your iPhone. Let's say you're going to use OBS, you really need to look at a camcorder. I hate I hate to keep beating that door down. I would not go out and buy a brand new one because you don't know if you're going to stick with this, right? 
So find something, HV40. You could probably find them now for 100 bucks on, on, on eBay, or may, maybe even a buck 50, okay? I would buy an HV40 because it does HDMI. It does 1080p. Start out with that. Buy yourself a good camcorder that you can zoom in. It has a remote. But try to get in. I mean, if I was going to do also, it, 400. Clean, clean HDMI out. Clean Make HDMI. Sure clean. Yes. Yeah. So you don't have the uh, images of the menu system on it. That's what clean yep. HDMI out means. Yep. But wouldn't, wouldn't you, Marty, I mean, wouldn't you go with a, a cheaper camcorder to start out as an yeah. all-around? Yeah, if you're just starting out, uh, because the next step up is you can get the mirrorless uh, cameras with flip-out screens that good ones are going to start in the you know $800 range. You start getting over $1,000. But 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 at least with what Steven's mentioning, I, and I completely agree, uh, it's a great way to start. And what I would say is is go that route, especially if you're just starting, but learn how to use the camera, learn all the technique, get the most out of what you have, but start there and, and make it the goal to get the most out of it. It's not necessarily going to be like, you're going to see YouTubers that have high end gear and all that stuff, but they're, they know how to use it and they've been practicing and they got it all set up just right. If you're just starting, that's a great way to start very versatile. And then if you decide, Oh man, I'm really into this. I'm getting good. I'm maxing out my, my equipment. It's always still going to be good to use. Like I have, I'm on a, right now I'm on a, the, the camera I'm using right here is like a 10 year old Sony camcorder, about $1,500 camcorder at the time, but HD, it's not 4k, but it's going to be good for years to come, at least in 1080p, you know, at least online, but you know, you can still repurpose that camcorder. So don't worry that you're not, you're not wasting your money, but make sure that you learn how to use the camera lighting, you know, stuff that Greg was talking about with lighting. That's very, very important. Audio, Learn the techniques. It's not all about the gear, but when you do that, and then you're also going to be able to tell, am I really into it? And well, then if you're not, then it's only like, you know, four or $500. You may even be able to resell it and you're not out that much, but so it's a good way to get into it. Totally agree. Um, um, Steven, that's definitely the way, I think that's the most well-rounded way to start. But even is, you, Greg, something like that. I, when I gave you that camcorder, I even told you it's not the be all end all, but it's enough to get you to that next level from a webcam. And then you took it to the next level and went to the PTZ optics. But now you could still mm -hmm. use that as an over the shoulder shot. You can it's use right it right here. A... It's being utilized. Um, and you know, I just had. I know we're we're, we're pushing our time now, but I, I thank guys. You know, Stephen and Marty, and we always do a post production talk. But even when we get toward the ends of the program, I just had that thought. Okay, if you were starting today, what camera would you, you know, would you utilize? Um, I think these are just practical things that that are good to hear. Um, so, yeah, I'm on board with you because that's how I started and learning from the best. So, I think 100% agree. I think that you know everybody. You know, I, you gotta have you gotta have a budget in mind, and you have to know what you can spend. If eighty dollars is all you can spend, get the best camera that you can for eighty dollars. I mean, sometimes you have to push it a little bit and give up something get the else. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The nine twenty. Yep. I'm, just, I'm just pulling this up real quick. And while I'm doing that, next week there will be no show. Um, I am on vacation, so I'm going to take some R&R &R next week. Um, it's a staycation. My brother's coming out. Uh, so we're going to be hanging out, maybe do some fishing with the kids and whatnot. So there won't be any shows at all from me next week. But the following week we'll be back. Um, and I just pulled this up on eBay real quick just to kind of show you guys. Uh, Canon Vixia HV40, honestly. 300 bucks. Some of them are like 219 for a HV40 or HV20. Any of the HV series right here, HV30, $189. If you're looking for a budget camcorder with clean HDMI, as, as Marty mentioned, get on eBay, buy yourself a used uh, Vixia HV40. It's plan on spending anywhere from 200 to $300. You won't be sorry. You'll get a good picture. You'll get the color correction stuff that's necessary um here's the xa40 it's the same one i have brand new 1500 bucks well you get all this other junk with it don't buy it with the junk just buy it just buy the camera yeah uh, if, if you're gonna go that route you don't need all that stuff you can buy better stuff sd cards but, but my point is you can get a streaming camera an all-around camera to shoot your youtube videos and whatnot but at the end of the day doesn't matter what we say you're in control of your own budget 
we can only suggest these are the things that you start out with. But ultimately, you have to pull the trigger, and you have to decide what's best for you and your budget. So, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out Mr. Greg Terry, youtube.com slash Greg Terry Experience. He will be live tomorrow night for Friday Fun Night at 8.30 mm -hmm. p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Thank you, Stephen. It's been an awesome, awesome night. Oh, always, always great to talk yeah, man. broadcasting, man. Also, Mr. Marty McPadden from PodJam.TV. You can check him out over there if you're looking for live video production or even remote video production. Remote or uh, podcasts Podcasting. or edits. or I do a lot of podcasts now, both video and audio. So He's your, he's your Final Cut guy because I go to him. I'm like, Marty, how do I, I, I do Final this? Cut <laughs> <laughs> like, how go. do I do this? In Final... He's like, oh, you just go here, you do here. So uh, always great to have him on. And I believe not next week. No show, but the following week, we will have our fourth member finally join us. He's been on location. Yay. So we'll have Mr. Jeffrey Fitzgerald, and I believe we're going to we're gonna talk about audio. I believe that's the next step. Oh, yeah, baby. Getting into some, and I know that's Greg's cup of tea. Um, I know enough to be dangerous and sort of sound decent. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think between the four of us here, we'll have a good, I mean, everybody's always asking, like with cameras, what microphone do I buy? So we're going to get into that, maybe give some demonstrations. I have some microphones here that I can switch in and out and be the guinea pig so you guys can hear. Why do I need to spend $300 on a microphone? Why do I need to spend 1000 We might be able to answer those questions for you. So next week, or in two weeks, broadcast now, we're going to cover some audio. Send in your comments. Leave your comments below of what you want us to talk about. Obviously, we'll get into lighting. We'll get into all these other things. But we need to know. We need to hear from you. Comment below. And until next time, guys, keep it buzzing. <laughs>